talk, everybody. Our speaker today is Becky Nevin, who's joining us from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, she got her BA in astrophysics at Whitman College in, I think, 2013. Yes. Yep. Uh, and has uh, won numerous fellowships and awards uh, since then, including an NSF graduate fellow, uh, a Ray May Smith graduate fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, and a PEO scholar award. So that which, which sounds interesting. So and also she yeah. was part of the, as we heard at the, the uh, early career scientist panel at the NSF at the uh, National Academy's decadal prep session. So she's a. Uh, uh, done a lot of work in using integral field spectrographs to study AGNs and their host galaxies, which is going to tell us about today, and is the author of numerous papers on the topic. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you're going to tell us, Becky, and about uh, identification of mergers in, uh, with imaging and kinematics from, I think, Manga. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. What a great introduction. Okay. Um, I think I'd like to allow questions throughout the talk. I don't know if you guys usually do that. Oh, yeah. But I find that it's, I mean, you probably will anyway, even if I don't say that. Um, please do politely raise your hand and interrupt me throughout. So yes, this is my most recent work. Um, I'm going about creating accurate identifications of merging galaxies in surveys. And mostly today, I'll be focusing on the imaging portion of this project, because this is the work that's currently in review. Um, I'm also developing a kinematic portion of identifying merging galaxies. So that's in the works. This will really help finish up my thesis. And so this is, again, at the University of Colorado. I work with Julie Comerford, Francisco Miller Sanchez, and Scott Barrows there. And then I have some external collaborators, Laura Blecas at University of Florida, and Jenny Green at Princeton. OK, and you will be seeing this beautiful image of NGC 6240 right here, prototypical merging galaxy throughout this talk today, so I'll return back to that. OK, motivation for why I'm doing what I'm doing. We know that galaxies have bimodal properties, right? Of course, if you plot color against mass of a galaxy, you can see that there's these red quiescent large galaxies, and there's these blue star-forming lower mass galaxies. Additionally, there's hints of evolution of galaxies over cosmic time, because there's more blue irregular star-forming galaxies in the higher redshift universe, in the more local universe, we observe more of these kind of red, large quiescent galaxies implying an evolution. This evolution is very, very complicated. There's a lot of processes that go into it. And I am just focusing on galaxy mergers as a process that can drive galaxy evolution. OK, back to NGC 6240. It's a ULERG ultra-luminous infrared galaxy, because it has a lot of active star formation and AGN activity infrared light. Um, again, it's a prototypical merger. And so this infrared light is linked to star formation and AGN activity, which are occurring as a result of this merger. And my group has actually looked very closely at this galaxy. Man, so it's almost not dark enough to see this. I mean, this is an HST image, so it's just weird color overlays. No one go to sleep. OK, so if I want to flip back. If we're going to zoom in on this central area of the galaxy, we call this area the butterfly, as you can see from this schematic down in the lower corner. And what my group has done has really been to look at this in, with different observations. So this is an HST, I think it's a three color image overlay, where the blue is oxygen three-ish, the red is H alpha, and then there's a green continuum underlying this. And so what I focused on is the kinematics of the large scale structures in the galaxy. And so I've looked specifically at this oxygen three cone you can see here, and I've determined that this is an AGN driven outflow. So that's interesting because we can actually model it and determine what are its energetics, what's its mass outflow rate. It's got about a 70 solar masses per year outflow rate. And then additionally, my collaborators have looked at this H alpha starburst driven outflow, and they see that its mass outflow rate is about 10 solar masses per year. And so what's interesting is you actually need both of these outflows together to theoretically affect the stars in the host galaxy. So this is a really interesting case of a merging galaxy that has both of these different types of outflows potentially impacting the ISM. How do you differentiate the two types? Um, it's a mix of kinematics and spatial positioning for this paper. Um, I definitely recommend going and looking this up. It's called the butterfly. 
in the literature. Yeah, and I can talk more about that later. Okay, so we can ask the question for mergers overall, is star formation triggered by mergers? Some say yes, of course, like NGC 6240, ULURGs are examples of star formation as a result of mergers. Some say yes, minor mergers are really important for driving the star formation budget of the universe, and in fact, they're more important than major mergers overall. Some say no, um, isolated galaxies are more important for the star formation budget. And then you can look at the more, it's complicated picture, like this study by Phil Hopkins, where he's looking at the bolometric luminosity function of galaxies um, plotted here with some theoretical galaxy contributions with these green, red, and blue lines. So what's being shown here is that the normal disk galaxies contribute a lot of light in star formation at the lower luminosity end, whereas at the higher luminosity end, obscured AGN and bursts from mergers are more important. So we're starting to see this more complicated picture of how does star formation happen in the universe. And part of the reason that this is really complicated is that all of these different works have different approaches to identifying merging galaxies. So we're working with heterogeneous samples of merging galaxies, which makes it really difficult to compare between. Additionally, there's some indication that star formation and AGN activity actually affect each other. And so I could ask the question, are AGN triggered by mergers? Again, some say yes. In fact, this study says that um, the fraction of AGN in mergers is higher, um, and it's dependent on the luminosity of those AGN. So in other words, you could think about this, like um, if you have a fraction one, this means that at this high luminosity AGN bin, 10 to the 46 ergs per second, almost all of your AGN are found in merging and or disturbed galaxies. So that's a definition of merging galaxies that's perhaps different from others. Um, additionally, some people say, yes, AGN are triggered by mergers, but it's not really a mass, or, or sorry, it's not really a luminosity dependent thing. And some people do say, no, there's no significant statistical difference between AGN and the relative control sample of galaxies for a given morphological class, where disturbed one and disturbed two is how they're defining merging galaxies. Question in the back. So is that really tracing the mass of the black hole or even the mass of the galaxy rather than what's what is that really telling us? Oh man. Um, I'm not sure if it's telling us anything about the mass here. I think I said mass accidentally here. Oh, I don't know. I, I, or if you were just wondering about the spot. So, hmm. Right, so there's... Yeah, so maybe it was a major merger. Yeah. Right, so there's a lot of questions you can ask then based upon some of these studies, like can we learn more specifically about how AGN are fueled, which is what I'm trying to do. Okay, so there's, a, again, a lot of open questions about what these studies actually mean if they actually conclusively say anything here. Um, but they're all steps along the way to solving this problem. Okay, so why is it actually so difficult to go out and accurately identify merging galaxies? Well, in the past, this has been done mostly using individual imaging surveys. So for example, you can use one or two imaging techniques in combination, create some cut in this imaging parameter space and define galaxies above some value as merging. So this works pretty well for some pretty bright local galaxies. And so, for example, one parameter space that has been used is the Genie M20 parameter space. And Genie is actually borrowed from, I believe, the economics people, because a higher Genie value indicates that wealth is more concentrated in a society. So this would be like, up here would be like the 1% of people hold the majority of wealth. Down here would be an egalitarian society. Likewise with light, the more concentrated the light, the higher your Genie value. M20 increases to the left, and basically means you have a more spatially extended galaxy as you increase the left. So Jennifer Lotz has really pioneered this work. Um, and here we see a cut that she has defined in Genie M20 space. Above this line, things are identified as mergers. And so here are some elliptical galaxies, some spiral galaxies, and then these are the Eulergs. Specifically, some of them have double nuclei. 
So GNEM20 does a pretty good job of identifying very bright merging galaxies with double nuclei, like the example as I've been showing of NGC 6240. Okay, you can use other imaging predictors, and I'm calling them predictors now because they're predictors if your galaxy is in a merger, like concentration, asymmetry, shape asymmetry, Sirsic index, and these are all different ways to define if a galaxy is merging, and they all have their own strengths and limitations. So for example, asymmetry does much better with these uh, stereotypical early stage mergers where you see the tidal tails, whereas concentration does much better in the later stages. Um, Shape asymmetry is interesting because it's actually a binary bit mask for asymmetry, so it does better at identifying these tidal features for a longer range of times because it's more sensitive to the fainter end of these tidal disruptions. Okay, so these all have different strengths and limitations. One way to improve our identification of merging galaxies is actually to combine multiple different methods, which has been done. So here's some work um, where they used a random forest to combine multiple different imaging predictors like asymmetry, clumpiness is with an S, concentration, genie, and this was directly applied to real galaxies in this work. So they were able to create a probability that something is in a merger and measure this for these real hypersupreme cam galaxies. Um, and here I'm showing the major merger distribution here, and you can see that it's somewhat contaminated by isolated and minor mergers down here. But the difficulty with applying this directly to imaging surveys is that you don't really understand how your tool is functioning. You don't really understand its limitations going in. You might have some idea, but maybe not a full idea. And so I want to stretch this method a little bit further by first looking at simulated galaxies. So my collaborator, Laura Blecka, runs these Gadget 3 hydrodynamic simulations of galaxy mergers with a sunrise dust radiative transfer back end, which is great because you can produce realistic SEDs and images. Uh, we might want the lights down for this, actually. Thanks. And so here's a beautiful, oh, if I can do this, high spatial, high temporal resolution merger. And it's not as beautiful on the projector, but I'll play it again. And so these are isolated galaxy simulations. We can view the galaxy merger from multiple different viewpoints for giga years, right? Because galaxy mergers last for a long time, so we have really high temporal resolution on these simulations. And so don't get too used to that beautiful simulation, because what I then do is I take these simulated galaxies and I degrade them to the spectral and spatial resolution of the Sloan survey. And so now I'm gonna be talking about the imaging portion of my identification scheme. So these are some of the imaging snapshots, and you can turn the lights back up. It gets real dark. The imaging snapshots from this simulated galaxy merger, and these are just a few of them. So what I do is I introduce background noise, and I convolve to the seeing of Sloan, and I additionally am chopping these to the postage stamp cutout so they're 50 arc seconds per side, which is about 30 kiloparsecs. And I'm dividing them into early stage, late stage, and post-coalescent stages of the merger. And so this is based upon uh, multiple, different, multiple different things. So early stage happen after first pericentric passage, but at separations greater than 10 kiloparsecs. And I define late stage when the stellar nuclei are separated by between one and 10 kiloparsecs, and post-coalescence is following that final coalescence of the two nuclei. Um, additionally, you might have noticed that this merger snapshot says isolated. I can take any of the merger snapshots from prior to first pericentric passage or after 0.5 giga years following final coalescence and use these as my isolated sample of galaxies. Okay, great. So some other advantages of using, using simulated galaxies are that we can really control the merger initial conditions, which are actually really important for determining what happens with your imaging predictors. So for example, we have some gas-rich major mergers, and this is the mass ratio of the mergers. I should mention that I'm defining major mergers anything with a mass ratio greater than, sorry, less than one to four. So here's our gas-rich major merger. We have a gas-poor 
major merger, which I'm trying to show with redder colors here. And of course, there's some minor mergers. And for each of these simulations, I have a match sample of isolated galaxies that are matched for mass and gas fraction. So after carrying out all this analysis, I determined that the mass ratio is the most important parameter for affecting how the imaging predictors behave. Rosalie. No. That would be really interesting, though. We were limited by time on the supercomputer, unfortunately. Um, so getting back to how I divided this up, I ended up making one combined simulation for the major mergers and one combined simulation for the minor mergers. And these are the main tools that I produced from this work, although I do run each of these simulations individually as well. So what I first did is I set out to measure some of these imaging predictors for the samples of merging and non-merging galaxies. And again, a real advantage of using simulated galaxies is, is that you know what is merging and what is not merging, which is not always clear from an observational sample of galaxies. So my non-merging galaxies are in blue on these um, distributions. Merging is pink or salmon. And so I measured Gini, M20, concentration, asymmetry, shape asymmetry, and the CIRSIC index for all these galaxies. And you can see by eye on an initial examination of these distributions that there's not really any one predictor that well separates merging from non-merging galaxies. And May I ask, how do you do the non-mergers? I mean, if it's hierarchical assembly, then presumably nearly everything has merged at some point. So what's your definition? Right, so this is not a cosmological merger simulation. It's just an isolated galaxy simulation. So we know that this is the initial merger. And I will get back to that in a little bit, comparing some of our results to some of the cosmological tree mergers where they're able to merge more than once. That's really interesting. Um, OK, so I can't use any one of these things on their own. So why not combine them all together using some fancy linear algebra? So I use a linear discriminant analysis to do this which is basically taking all of these six input predictors and creating a six-dimensional space. And in this six-dimensional space, there are distributions of merging and non-merging galaxies. What linear discriminant analysis does is it solves for the hyperplane in that space that best separates these populations. And what's great is that hyperplane is a linear combination of these input predictors. OK, so this hyperplane is called LD1, or the first discriminant axis of the linear discriminant analysis. And um, it can be given by, again, a linear combination of these input terms. So this is a little bit messy, but it is a complicated um, input equation. So keep in mind that uh, these are all linear inputs of Gini, M20, concentration, et cetera. The leading term, or coefficient, shows the relative importance of that imaging predictor to the major merger classification. And so for the major mergers, asymmetry and shape asymmetry are the most important inputs. Wait, yes? So that's like negative? Is that like the concentration? Right, so, um, it's like so concentration loss. actually decreases for some of the major mergers. And you can think about that as in during some of the early stages, they're just so disturbed that the concentration oh, does yeah, drop. Sorry. Yeah, so this is a combined effect for all different stages of the merger, is what you're looking at right now. Um, and so this is really hard to think about in terms of an equation, so I also have some histograms for this. So here's the major merger classification up top. This is LD1, again, the first linear discriminant axis. And you can see that it better separates these populations right off the bat. And so the great thing about LD1 is that it is a non-binary classifier. It basically assigns a probability that your galaxy is merging or not. So let's say I wanted to go look at a galaxy in Sloan. I could go for that galaxy, measure Gini, M20, et cetera, et cetera, plug it into this equation, get a value for LD1, get a non-binary probability that the galaxy is merging, and it would fall somewhere on this axis. right? So right now I'm just showing the 50% um, excuse me, the 50 um, decision boundary. OK. So the minor merger classification actually differs from the major merger one, which is interesting. You can see that it's less well separated, which makes some sense because minor mergers are not as obvious in some of these imaging predictors. 
And so the decision boundary moves over and there's less separation between these two classes. But I would argue that it still does a pretty good job of separating out the minor mergers. And another main difference between these two classifications is the most important predictors change. So for example, for the major mergers, asymmetry and shape asymmetry are very important. For the minor mergers, concentration and things that are similar to concentration are very important. Question in the back. Mm. Yeah, it does depend on the mass ratio because I have a couple different mass ratio minor mergers. And um, this is all, so in addition to making uh, this sort of plot, I also analyze the individual um, simulations in my upcoming paper. So this is, I guess I would just say for now that it is slightly better separated for the one to five mass ratio merger than for the one to 10. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. So are you most interested in being able to identify a complete, a, uh, complete sample of mergers or a clean sample of mergers, even if you miss some? A clean sample of mergers. Okay. okay, I'll get to that in a second, too. Maybe, no, not right now, but in a minute. Um, okay, so one of the main outcomes of this work is that the imaging predictors do evolve over the timeline of the merger. And that's what I'm trying to show here with this animation for seven different viewpoints of the same merger. So again, this is the decision boundary from Jennifer Lotz. If you fall above this line, you are designated or identified as a merger, identifiable by the Genium 20 space. And it turns out that the late stages of the merger, when you can see the two stellar nuclei most clearly, are the most identifiable, identifiable by Genium 20. So are those different viewing angles that we're seeing there? Right, these are seven different isotropic viewing angles. Don't ask me why it's not six. <laughs> yes. And I've made this plot for um, multiple different mergers as well. OK, so this is kind of foreshadowing that Genium 20 really functions well for a specific stage in the merger. Likewise, different imaging predictors pick up different times in the merger as well. So asymmetry does better with this kind of like visually disturbed early stage. Here's where Genium 20 thrives, and concentration does better in the post-coalescent stages of the merger. OK, brief interlude to talk about cosmological simulations versus my isolated galaxy simulation. So there's different advantages of using different types of simulations. I sort of mentioned this already. Cosmological simulations are really advantageous for looking at a merger tree evolution of a galaxy, because galaxies don't just merge one and then, once and then they're done. Um, additionally, cosmological simulations like Illustrious are good at looking at different morphologies of galaxies. They're much more diverse in that aspect. We chose to focus on these isolated galaxy simulations because they really have the high time resolution that we wanted for this case. Additionally, we were able to control the input parameters um, for our specific suite of simulated galaxies. But I can compare my work to Greg Snyder's work. He's looking at um, the cosm illustrious simulations of merging galaxies, which is a cosmological simulation. And I find that our results actually agree pretty well. So here we see he's plotting the importance for past mergers of a merging predictor against the importance for future mergers. So if you were to draw a line right down the center of this plot, these imaging predictors that fall on this line are equally important for finding something that's about to merge versus finding something that has merged. And anything above it, like these imaging predictors, which are things like f of genium 20, which is really um, a probe of how far right are you on that genium 20 diagram, and concentration are better probes of past mergers, which I also find they're better at identifying the post coalescence stages. Whereas the classic S of genium 20, which is the same genium 20 that I'm using in my work, is better at identifying future mergers, AKA the late stages of the merger. Yes? This business with the, with the past mergers is, must be gas dependent. If you have a lot of gas, there's going to be a lot of central concentration. If you have no gas, there's going to be less. Is that all somehow averaged out in your simulations? Yeah, so I do have um, some different gas fractions 
for my simulations. Unfortunately, we weren't able to go super gas poor. Our lowest gas fraction is 0.1. Um, and our average gas fraction is about 0.3. Which is so I'm not sure if I'm an answering your question. Yeah. But we did find with our suite, the most important thing was the mass ratio. The gas fraction didn't matter that much. How many different people? No, just how good are people? Oh, how good are people? Because you use people to calibrate your optical images and then <laughs> apply these various criteria. So they're setting the ground truth. But if mm -hmm. you got these people back in to take a look at the simulations, how well do they do? So how well do they do, I'm not sure I understand, at measuring these well, values? No, whether they're minor mergers, major mergers. He wants to Oh, Galaxy Zoo. I do have a whole section where I do that, too. Um, yeah, people's visual classifications are not necessarily great. No, I, I hate to knock them, but. No. Oh, I get what you're asking. This is, this is me trying to make myself into a machine mm -hmm. so that I don't fall victim to some of the problems of people. But your training set. I did. Be I chose what the simulation suite should be. No. How did you choose those? So these are all, so right now, up until this point, we're only looking at simulated galaxies. And that's like the main reason I want to look at simulated galaxies first, is so that I know if something is merging or is not merging. And that was not a bi -I classification. The only thing that's bi -I here is Lotz's definition of the line in Gini, Gini M20 space. That she did that by she started that by by I. But but that's in, but that's independent of mm -hmm. that's independent of where the galaxies she's talking about actually lie in that space. Her right. merger cut is a function of that. That line is a function of visual identification. But nothing that gets put on the plot is. Right, so I'm just measuring the relative Gini and M20 values. I'm not actually using the line in my classification. I basically use it as a comparison to how I would do if I were just using her like past identification technique. Um, so if I were just using her past identification technique only from Gini M20, I would only pick up the late stages of these mergers. But the LDA technique is able to really expand that merger timeline. Where were we? Okay. Great. Speaking of which, it has the longest timeline of a merger observability compared to other methods. So if I'm going to go out and implement Genium 20 asymmetry, how does it compare? So if this is the total timeline of the merger, which is um, variant based upon what the mass ratio of the merger is, but here I'm averaging over all of them, Genium 20 only picks up 8% of the timeline of the merger. Asymmetry finds 18% of the timeline of the merger. Shape asymmetry does better, and this is, again, because I predict that it's good at picking up some of those really low surface brightness tails. And then my LDA technique um, is able to identify mergers as such for 91% of the merger timeline. So it really expands upon these past techniques, partially because it's combining all of them together and really building off of their strengths. OK, so how precise and accurate is the technique? Um, so here I'm showing a confusion matrix tested on simulated galaxies of, here's your input. So let's say I'm inputting a non-merging galaxy. What will the classification technique classify it as is what this matrix is trying to show. So most of the time, it classifies non-mergers as non-mergers. A very, very small percent of the time does it classify non-mergers as mergers. And this is good because we're trying to build a very clean sample of merging galaxies. We don't want contamination from non-merging galaxies in our sample of merging galaxies. Um, it's more likely that your merger will be identified as a non-merger. So this just means we're missing about 20% of the mergers. Um, so these are false negatives in the identification. And so then I asked the question, well, how does this actually work on real galaxies? So I preliminarily applied it to some galaxy zoo galaxies. So these are galaxies that have been identified by users by eye in Galaxy Zoo. And so I'm taking 150 super clean Galaxy Zoo galaxies, which basically means 95% of users agree. And I'm taking some from the merging category, 
spiral, and elliptical. And I'm setting my uh, merger classification technique on them. So first I use the major merger technique. And I find merger probabilities of 95% likelihood, 10%, 44%. So if I were to draw the threshold value, the threshold probability at 50%, that would indicate that this is a merger, non-merger, non-merger. And so for all of these 150 galaxies, the major merger identifies about 80 to 90% of the mergers as such, which makes sense because the super clean mergers in Galaxy Zoo are indeed very visually disturbed mergers. And it identifies less than 10% of spirals as mergers and less than 10% of ellipticals as mergers. What's really interesting is when I introduce the minor merger technique, which does also identifies about 80 to 90% of mergers as mergers, but then it identifies about 30% of Galaxy Zoo spirals as mergers. So there's a difference here between the minor merger and the major merger technique. And in fact, the minor merger technique identifies this galaxy as a merger. So there's a lot of work to be done here. For example, is that a star forming region or is that actually a minor merger? This is really hard to do. I need to do this in the future. Um, likewise, there are some galaxies that are obvious major mergers that the technique misses. So for example, here is that same galaxy I just showed. It's identified as a merger. It does not identify this galaxy as a merger. How many people think this is a merger? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think this is a merger um, by eye. But my eyeball is not a robot. And so what's actually happening here is that the machine is looking at this galaxy and actually measuring a very low value of asymmetry and shape asymmetry because it happens to be a very symmetric merger. So I really want to look more into this, um, why this is happening, how often this might happen. And so I need to apply it to a larger sample of real galaxies. Well, the class must be really way off. Though. Yeah. Um, you don't, you don't care so much about the false negatives, though. Right? You care about the false positives. Right, I really do care about the false positives. So that would be the mode of failure that I most want to investigate. But this is an interesting you know, false negative here that by eye we're like, yes, this is a merger. So you can adjust the, um, you can really play with these thresholds. If you want more false negatives or more false positives, you can basically slide your threshold value around. And so that's really my next step, is to determine how to do that. Um, OK. But my main next step is to look at kinematic maps, because Manga is an IFS and imaging survey. And so the power is really in these um, spectral maps of these galaxies uh, that are spatially resolved. And so not only that, but there's 10,000 galaxies in the survey, and they're nearby galaxies. So I really want to go out and identify merging galaxies within the survey. Here's probably my second or third favorite galaxy. This is a major merger in Manga. OK, so I've already done some work here to extract kinematic maps, velocity and velocity dispersion, from the sunrise data. So these are all, from, these are all simulated galaxies. And what I've done is I've, again, introduced some noise, um, done some convolution. And I've actually run the SEDs from sunrise through the Manga pipeline to produce these maps, trying to extract them in much the same way that real observed maps are. OK, so looking at these galaxies, this rightmost one is a isolated galaxy. And you can see that the stellar velocity map is more or less disk-like. But then over here, you have a late stage merger that's got some disturbance in the stellar velocity map. And here is a very late stage merger that still has some disturbance in the disk, and I apologize for not being able to see these in imaging very well. But that's kind of the story, right? Like, if the surface brightness is very low of the galaxy, it's difficult to identify in imaging. So let's combine imaging with kinematic predictors to better determine if a galaxy is merging. And so I can extract various kinematic predictors, mostly using kinemetry, which is a disk modeler, and doing things like comparing the kinematic and imaging position angle and seeing how misaligned they are. And my eventual goal is for this tool to be publicly available on my GitHub repository. And I've actually already created a logo for this identification technique, because this is a mongoose 
returning with a merging galaxy down here. Um, so this tool is actually very tweakable, which is really important because you can actually change it for different noise imaging IFS surveys. So not only can you apply it to Sloan and Manga, but you can apply it to things like HST, JWST. Also keep in mind that there's some um, kinematics from JWST that can be exploited. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly conclude and then maybe talk about something else for a second. Yeah, okay. So up until now, I have created two different identification schemes for major and minor mergers using simulated galaxies. Um, I'm planning to apply the technique to Sloan for just the imaging and manga when I have the imaging and kinematics and answer some, or at least ask some important questions about galaxy evolution in these clean samples of merging galaxies like, do galaxy mergers trigger more luminous AGN? How is star formation proceeding in these galaxy mergers? Okay, and I'm pushing my time, but I wanna talk about my future project. 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Yeah. Oh, does it go after? I'm looking oh, at that clock, oh, okay. which might be off. We started at my watch, my watch is Great, well, I'll take as much time as I can get. Um, okay, so I just talked about introducing kinematic predictors, and I just wanted to show another map of what this might look like for a simulated galaxy. So this is the same merger in a late stage for this top row, where you can clearly see the kinematic disturbance. Um, down here is a post-coalescence merger. It's been 0.4 giga years since this galaxy has coalesced the two nuclei. And over here you can see a counter-rotating disk. So this has been predicted to be a signature of a merging galaxy. This is an example of when the merger is not particularly apparent in the imaging, the kinematic maps can actually reveal more structure and more information. And so to date, I've only divided the um, classification scheme by mass ratio. I also want to probe different stages of mergers in the universe. So I wanna first create a pre-coalescence major merger classification and then a post-coalescence major merger classification and do the same for minor mergers. So with these samples of galaxies, I hope to clean them, match them in manga for things like redshift and mass rate and mass, excuse me, and then answer some important science questions. So first I wanna get at the merger fraction of galaxies in the local universe. So here's some work um, also by Jennifer Lotz looking at observed merger fractions in the universe. And again, these are measured using different techniques. So here's one that relies just on genium 20 in the green. And here's one that relies just on asymmetry in the red. And the rest are close pairs, which have been shown to have a lower um, accuracy than methods even such as genium 20 and asymmetry. So based upon preliminary work that I've done identifying merging galaxies, in just Sloan imaging, I can conservatively say that my method increases the accuracy by at least a factor of two above some of these other methods. So I really predict that I'm gonna find a lot more mergers than this merger fraction might imply from previous observations. And furthermore, I believe that the minor mergers are, um, the minor merger, merger fraction is really poorly determined. So it'd be really interesting to place constraints on that with my minor merger samples. And then finally, I wanna look at some spatial resolved star formation history. So this is just a preliminary example of a merging galaxy I picked out of manga, where the stellar population age is given here. So these two nuclei are about 10 giga years old, and uh, these tidal tails are younger. And I wanna look at the star formation history and the metallicity gradients for these different populations of merging galaxies. And that's really key to also look at metallicity gradients in addition to these star formation histories because of course they're probing how the gas is actually being accreted. And so in the past you often do this with an integrated spectra, spectrum, but here it's being done not for manga, but for two merging spiral galaxies. And it's been shown here that the metallicity in the center has a lower abundance than previously thought. So this is thought to point towards accreting low metals, metallicity gas towards the center of a merging galaxy. And the slope is in log space, but it's flatter than expected for a matched isolated galaxy. 
Okay. Um, this is an exciting galaxy I wanted to talk about, but I can also end here. What do you think? Well, let's see some time for questions. Yeah, okay. We'll end here. All right. I'll go back here. Boop, boop. Thank you. Circular harmonic decompositions of these images and feeding all of those parameters in and just seeing what it picks out to distinguish images. That would be very interesting. And I have actually done that. Um, and I, I might have gone even a step further because what I did was just feed um, a convolution neural network just the image, um, right? But that is almost, that's very black boxy because you're just letting it run with whatever properties it picks out of an image. So it would be interesting to maybe take a more rigorous uh, computer science approach to this problem. I've seen people in the past that have identified have tried to create similar machine learning tools to identify emerging galaxies, but then don't really analyze the output. So it would be really interesting to maybe try some more predictors. I chose these six because I wanted to keep it somewhat contained and I wanted to be able to directly compare to past work. And then when I arrived at the end, I said, okay, the accuracy and precision is high enough for what I wanna do with my science goals that I'm gonna move on and do some more astronomy with these objects as opposed to really like Maybe if I wanted to go into um, computer science and make a lot more money, I could have definitely focused on this for a lot longer. It would have been interesting. Yeah. One of the big questions has always been how the merger rate changes as a function of redshift. Mm -hmm. uh, do you envision somehow using your method to then generate uh, the, your predictions or your measures as a function of redshift because the resolution keeps changing and the big issue is how do you separate resolution effects from true merger rate changes. Mm -hmm. uh, will you do that? And in this case, will you, end, will you use somehow photometric redshift estimates of the examples you are analyzing to help you? So I have played with redshift a little bit in the simulated galaxies. I'm gonna say a couple of things and I hope that I'm answering your question by saying a couple of different things. So I've adjusted the Sloan galaxies, the simulated Sloan galaxies to have higher redshift. And I've shown that the technique really begins to fail, like it's not the same classification um, when you reach some of the limits of the Sloan survey. So I couldn't do this for like higher redshift Sloan galaxies. It only really works out to like 0.4 which is not a problem for Manga because Manga is very low redshift. So in my paper, I really caution against taking this tool and applying it to higher redshift galaxies. That being said, it has been shown to be difficult in different ways to identify high redshift galaxies, which I didn't really get into at all today um, because they're inherently different morphologically and they're inherently different kinematically. So I think a really cool project would be to actually use um, some higher redshift data as your simulation input. Um, so maybe adjust to the JWST filters or something. I haven't 100% thought this through, but I think you need to run it from the beginning to apply it to higher redshift galaxies. I don't think this technique can just be used. And I do think that the merger rate changes um, at different redshifts, and that's definitely people are, something people are investigating. I've really chosen to focus this project just on you know, this left half of this plot. Unfortunately, that's the regime that I've been able to probe with these simulations. Okay. All right, well, we'll go to lunch uh, now in case anybody wants to join.